What's up everybody, the Network Berg here, and in this lesson, we're just going to be going over the theory of routing on router OS. But don't let it put you off, don't be too worried, the next video will cover configurations and stuff. But this is such an important topic that I wanted to have a video for it exclusively. So please enjoy and let's get into it. All right, I don't want to read everything just word for word because that might turn into a pretty boring thing because then you might as well just read the PDFs. Um, so you're welcome to read through the things, the slide information while it's up on the screen, but I just want to give you my take on routing itself. So routing in essence is a mechanism that allows us a means of transporting packets across between different networks. So if we look at a network, uh, it typically consists of something like your hosts at the bottom, and then as you move up, you, you get your switches, which deals with the MAC addresses and forwarding frames and stuff. And then finally you get your routers, which is where all of the, the heavy hitting stuff is actually going to be happening because your routers are uh, responsible for two things really. The one is to stop broadcast traffic so that traffic stays in its broadcast domain. And the other thing is the router is responsible to forward the traffic out. It's supposed to route the traffic, send it out somewhere else. And this is in essence how the internet works. Everything is in, is literally connected to another router. My router at my home, it's going to be connected to my ISP's router somewhere further down the line. Maybe I've got a fiber cable coming in and then this fiber cable um, will get to a switch of theirs and the switch will eventually get up to a router somewhere in a data center. And then that router will connect to another router and another router and another router. And eventually until it gets to either my office or if I'm playing games against somebody, um, it, it gets to those people's routers as well. And that is the, the gist of routers and the internet. But it shows you how important these devices are and understanding how routing works is very important. So let me just go on to the, the next... Uh, like a thingy, uh, Microtik route selection process. So Microtik in essence has two things happening in the back end whenever you're working with the routing. The one thing being uh, it's it's got a routing information base or a rib and that you can think of the calculations happening in the back end. We as administrators can sort of alter some of those calculations by using things like uh, route filters or mangle rules or whatnot. But for the most part, it is a calculation that happens in the back end that we don't see. It's the calculator. We press the buttons and inside the calculator is figuring out the best path to get to a specific destination. And then we as the administrators, at the end of the, the day, we see the FIB, the forwarding information base. So whenever we open up IP route or the routing table, what we see present in the table is the end result of after what happened on the routing information base, we see the forward information base. So now we understand, we see what conclusion the router has gotten to and how it's going to send packets out of the network. So that is something that you need to know about. Um, I'm mentioning here, you, you do get various different types of routes and there's also different types of routing flags that you need to be aware of. But typically uh, you'll see there are stuff that we call directly connected routes which typically occurs whenever you create an IP address and you bind it to an interface, whatever IP range is configured against that interface, that would be considered a directly connected route. And that route will typically always be preferred over anything else. Actually, it will always just be preferred. That's just how it is. Uh, then you get stuff like static uh, routes that you can add, which we as administrators, we go into a routing table, we click on a little plus or we do it in the command line and we can specify ourselves how to route the traffic out. How do we want the traffic to get out of the network? And then ultimately, like I mentioned, the MTC and INE and then the BGP stuff I was talking about, we get stuff that are called dynamic routing protocols. So that is your OSPF, your BGPs, your RIP, uh, all, all of those type of things just that can automatically update the routing table where we don't need to intervene. And those things you'll come more across in the ISP spectrum, especially if you are an ISP provider, then you'll start to see more of those type of protocols. But if you're just a home user or you're just doing the MTCNA and you just need to um, figure out routing, then basically what you'll be working with is static routes and just understanding how the routes work. Um, I'm also mentioning route distances and longest prefix match, which is great. So a route distance uh, in essence is a route with the lowest distance. So the smaller number when you look at the distances is typically the route that would be preferred. Other vendors like to call this the administrative distance. You'll see it on Cisco, you'll see it on Juniper. It's just the, the route that's the 
let's say the least furthest away that's a good way to look at it so, um, that's the route that it's going to take to get there um, ultimately and then we get our longest prefix match which is in essence if you look at your prefixes you get like a slash 24 which most people are aware of like a 192.168.0.0 slash 24 network but the further up you walk, get on that line so if i go to a slash 25 a slash 25 route would be preferred over a slash 24 route and i'll i'll show you kind of the trick in that when we get into subnetting well not we're not going to go fully into subnetting but you'll see what a longest prefix match is when we discuss it more in depth now all right so here i've got a nice little routing table just showing you how to access the routing table so you go to the ip you go to routes and then you can see the different types of things happening there so this the red block that I've basically highlighted, that is your routing table, that's your routing information. You'll see there's different types of columns there, giving you certain types of information. But this is where all of the routing information is stored at the end of the day for the router. The blue routes that I've highlighted, if you see a route that's blue, that's typically a route that is inactive. So it hasn't been selected by the rib as being the most preferred route. And then on the fib, it will just reflect that and the route will be blue. Just saying this route, it is there, the router is aware of it, but it's not actively making use of the route. And then if you see the route is grayed out, then that's obviously a route that somebody has disabled. Uh, with dynamic routing protocols, if you learn the routes dynamically, they're typically, that's not something you disable. You'd use a routing filter to stop seeing those routes. But um, yeah, if, if you've statically configured routes, you want to disable them, or if they are disabled, they'll just be grayed out like this. Okay, so here specifically, we want to talk about routing distances. So in that box, you see there is the distance, and I've already actually covered this now. So the distance is just whatever's the lowest distance, that is the route that will be considered the best. Uh, longest prefix match. So here I'm giving some examples. Um, but at the very bottom, if you look at the, the subnet portion that I put in here. So if you see a routing table, and uh, here I say, you want to know where traffic will be routed for 192.168.2.30. And you see there's multiple different routing entries that exist for the .2 network. So there's 192.168.2.0 slash 24, 192.168.2.0 slash 25, and 192.168.2.0 slash 26. So if you write those subnets just into a subnet mask format, so slash 24 is 255.255.255.0, um, slash 25 is 255.255.255.128 and then the slash 26 is 255.255.255.192 so if I look at this this would be kind of the longest prefix match there's more of these network bits that's on so this is technically the longer match whenever the routing table needs to decide which one is preferred because this dot 30 host exists in all three of these routes but the active route or the one that would be preferred would be the slash 26 because that is the longest prefix match. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. Okay, now I also just want to go over the routing flags quickly. So routing flags are different types of statements about a route and what that route is currently doing. So if you see the X or if it's grayed out, it's disabled. If it's A, it's active and it's going to be a dark color in the routing table. If it's dynamically learned, you'll see a D. If you see it's a directly connected route, you'll see it will be like uh, the C here. If it's a static route, it will be an S. And these are your routing protocols, RIP, BGP, OSPF, MME. And a black hole route would be B, which sounds pretty cool, but uh, it's, it's at the end of the day, that's just you sending traffic to the abyss so it will never get anywhere. Um, and then you get these un reachable and prohibited uh, notifications. And I'll show you that in the MTCRE stuff. This, you don't really need to know for the MTC and A. But I just wanna go back to this routing table and the flags will come up in this little block. So here you can see there's the different type of uh, flags associated with them. And I'd like to talk about this route quickly because this comes up a lot. This is your default route, 0000 slash zero, zero, zero. And this basically tells you how to get out to the internet, right? And I think I've told you guys this in, a, in an earlier video, but that's your internet route. But if you use something like a triple PoE connection or a DHCP client to obtain a default route, you might see a route saying something like DAS. So this is quite strange because the D stands for dynamic, 
but the S stands for static as well. So how can that be? <laughs> how does that happen? And I'm just quickly going to explain that. So a DAS route can occur, and that is only in the event of the triple POE or DHCP client assigning this, because the router is actually statically creating the route for you. The router is injecting that static route in the routing table, but it did dynamically get that route from a server somewhere, either a triple POE server or from the um, DHCP server. All right, so that, that is why you might see a DAS server sometimes. So don't, don't be too freaked out if you see a flag that says DAS. All right. Oh, I, I could have just gone right here. So here you can see a better example of the flags as well. And if you do IP route print from the command line, you'll also see the flags right there. And the, the boxes are exactly the same if you think about it. It's just uh, whatever you prefer, what you think is better. All right, here we can discuss the routing protocols. I have briefly gone over them, but again, you get OSPF, BGP, RIP, um, but it's all, uh, you don't really need to know in depth the working of these uh, or inner workings of these protocols. You just need to understand they exist. So if you see routes being learned by OSPF and maybe you do have a network engineer working above you, maybe you're a um, tier one or level one engineer and you need to escalate, they might deal with the OSPF bits and then you can tell them, okay, I see this is, being learned by OSPF and it's not working, can you maybe uh, help us check that out a bit further? What I do want to explain just briefly, just briefly with the routing is each of these routing protocols do work in a different type of sense as well. So a static route is something we define as administrators. OSPF is also dynamic routing, so it's across the network, but it works within one area, it works inside your network. So you're not going to have your OSPF connect to another service provider's OSPF network and you guys are going to be exchanging routes like that because it's going to be very messy. Um, OGP is, OSPF is also an IGP, an interior gateway protocol, so it means it is used in its own area. Where you get something else like BGP, that's an EGP or an exterior gateway protocol, and this is something that we use for the internet itself. BGP is actually responsible for internet. It's, it's the reason why all our routers know how to connect across the network to eventually get to each other. So that's really, really an awesome protocol. And if we get to an MTCI and anything, we'll go over the BGP stuff as well. All right, now we're looking at creating a default route. So this is us as administrators specifying ourselves instead of learning it through a DHCP client or through something like triple POE. So if we read what I've written here, a default route can be considered a catch-all route, which simply put will be a route the router will use to forward traffic if any prefix is not matched in the routing table. So that's absolutely correct. That 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, 0, 0.0.0.0 0 route, if no routes exist in your routing table for the destination and there is a zero route, or I'm going to just call it the internet route, then it will always take that path out and go to the next gateway that's been specified there. And then it becomes that gateway's problem to try and get to that final destination because it, <laughs> that's how routing works. You, you just kind of pass the traffic onto another router and you kind of hope that they know um, where that's going. If they don't have any route for that specific destination, they'll drop to the traffic. If your own router doesn't have anything, so it doesn't have a default route or any routes, uh, it will also just discard those routes. All right, let me just go on here. So to add a default route, pretty straightforward. You go to your IP menu, you go to your routes, you click on the plus, and then you specify destination and the gateways. And the gateway is very important. That's going to be your next hop where you're going to be sending the traffic towards. And we'll look at that in the, the lab type of thing or the actual setup in the next video. And then routing between different networks. So this works on, I'm not going to say the assumption, but this works off of the... Um, idea that you are connected to different routers and you are aware of what networks they have hosted and you are hosting specific networks and maybe they want to get to your networks as well. So in essence, you'll be able to set up routing between the routers or towards a different router so that you can eventually actually get to that specific destination. Uh, here I've got a little diagram just showcasing kind of what routing would work like. So let me see, can I get my mouse here? Yes, I can. So I've got a computer here in this 192.168.30.0 slash 24 range. The computer's IP address is dot 100. And then there is a little microtech with dot one being the default gateway. So this computer would use dot one as its default gateway. It, it would have its own zero route 
and it would send that to the MicroTik and then it becomes the MicroTik's problem to try and get somewhere. And let's say this computer on the left hand side wanted to get to 172.16.20.200 which was maybe a web server or um, some kind of um, file server or something. Then what would happen in that case is this router, router 1, would need to know how to get to this IP range. And in its routing table, maybe it doesn't have any routes. And now you need to statically set a route. But you can see there is a link between router 1 and router 2. And this IP between the two routers is 10.18.0.0/30, with router 1 having dot 1 and router 2 having dot 2. So in this event, router 1 would have to have a route setup that specifies 172.16.20.200 or not 200.0/24 is its destination and to get to that destination I will use .2's IP or router 2's IP address here to get there so it would have a route for that destination and it would push the traffic to 10.18.0.2 router 2 would get that traffic and then it would say hey I've got this and my directly connected routes, I'll send it off over that port and then the server would get it and um, that's traffic working in one way. But just like the Tango, it takes two. So router two would also need to know how to get to this IP addressing on the left hand side. So router two would also have a destination route for 192.168.30.0.24 and it would push that destination or it would use 10.18.0.1 as its gateway and this would now be considered a return route so now these two IP ranges would be able to communicate with each other seamlessly there wouldn't be any issues with communication all right so that is in base how routing works uh, we're going to be ending off the video here and I'll catch you in the next video where we actually have a lab and we'll set up some routing thanks for watching